This is the lecture for cross-link thermoplastics for thermoset resins. This is the only unique information that will be on the final exam. The bulk of the information that's on the final exam will be the same lectures that were covered for exams one, two, and three. Again, this is comprehensive. This is the only unique lecture that it was not present on the other exams. Um, and so why are we talking about thermoplastics? This, is, this class is thermosets. Well, it's because these are cross-linked. Um, this was primarily driven by the need for property enhancement. If you slightly cross-link these type of thermoplastic polymers, it improves the resistance to thermal degradation and improves resistance of cracking in other, by liquids or other harsh environments. Also, it creates enhanced resistance to creep and cold flow. Typically, what you're cross-linking are olefins, and the, tip, the, the main one being polyethylene. Sometimes acrylate, sometimes poly, not PVC, but typically polyethylene is what you're actually cross-linking. So, very rudimentary uh, diagram, but it shows uncross-linked polyethylene versus cross-linked polyethylene. You're creating bridges between the ethylene chains through some of these hydrogens uh, by abstracting hydrogens off of there and lightly cross-linking the material to enhance properties. You can accomplish this a couple of different ways. You can irradiate or can, you can use chemical agents. And what this does is it interconnects the long thermoplastic polymer chains through the covalent bonds. And what you get is the same thing as if you had a lightly cross-linked thermoset. So you have a polyolefin chain, a polyethylene chain, uh, that now is now linked to other poly polyethylene chains. So it has the same overall effect of cross-linking and enhancing properties as a result. When it comes to irradiation cross-linking, uh, you can irradiate the, with X-rays or gamma rays or high energy electrons and you get a considerable change in physical properties from this just this small chemical change. At first you can get something that becomes more flexible and transparent and it changes from when it changes from a crystalline to amorphous material upon cross-linking. After if you expose it to radiation too long it will become uh, brittle. So you have so you want you're shooting for kind of a median amount of cross-linking. Um, physically the polymer itself becomes increasingly insoluble because you're increasing cross-linking. You can uh, pretty carefully control these, and you can cover a wide range. Uh, most of the time, the radiation dose is about is up to 60 millirads, um, and this gets you limited cross ring reactions that can still proceed in the solid state. Um, the object is molded into its final state, and then it's subsequently irradiated. So you have it molded, and then you irradiate it to give its required properties. What you're doing is producing ions, and then, then your, the molecules are then in an excited state, and both of these actions produce free radicals. Uh, you can also get a little bit of uh, hydrogen gas liberation, but you're creating some a limited amount of unsaturated carbon-carbon double bonds, and then the free radicals that you create attack those double bonds and cross-link. Um, cross-linking, just in any other thermoset, increases tensile strength, increases hardness, decreases solubility, and increases resistance to environmental stress cracking. When it comes to polyethylene, it's really cheap, but it has really bad environmental stress cracking resistance. So to get the best of both worlds, this is one way to do that for vessels that require these type of properties. And these are often used for large tanks, like fuel tanks and things like that. Uh, you can also use this in a polyethylene foam. Uh, these are good for buoyancy, compression resistance, shock absorption. Uh, thermal or electrical insulation, vibration dampening, and moisture protection. Uh, these are often used in automotive cushioning, shock absorption for recreation, and then biomedical support devices. There is something called the uh, irradiation-induced elastic memory phenomenon. Uh, when you have th this particular thing, even when you cross-link these polymers, they behave like typical thermoplastics below their crystalline melting range. That they behave like elastomers above their crystalline melting range. Uh, it's possible to deform the polymer in its amorphous state above the crystalline melting range when these are cross-linked. And then you freeze or cool the polymer in that deformed state and it remains in that deformed state because it's been cooled back down. Uh, and it stays in that deformed state and uh, above that crystalline mel melting range. The nice thing about this is it can be used for heat shrinkable tubing because of these post-irradiation effects. So please enjoy this high quality uh, um, diagram. So what this means 
is you take a rubber band, if you hang a weight on it to stretch it and deform it, and then you heat it, say like with a hair dryer, it will return to its original unstretched deformed ge geometry. That's what all that, you know, uh, long-winded explanation that I just gave you. So you heat it, you stretch it, you heat it, it shrinks back up again, you cool it, it will return to its original position. That's what, it really, what we're really talking about. So you can do the cross-linking with the radiation, you can also do the cross-linking by chemicals. And what that means is uh, you use organic peroxides in the presence of these polyethylenes. So uh, the way you have to use organic peroxides is you have to heat them up uh, to get the peroxide to degrade into free radicals. And then those free radicals will abstract hydrogens from the chain and you'll create uh, cross-links that way. So the end result is, is similar, but typically this is done while the part is being made as opposed to making the, heart, the part and then irradiating it. So the polymer and the peroxide are milled or mixed together. It's shaped and then heated. And then while it's being heated and shaped, it induces the decomposition of the peroxide initiator. And at the same time, the polymer is in the molten state. So as the molecular weight grows, it becomes more increasingly cross-linked and the polymer becomes more solid. And then the polymer completely cross-links and you get a, and then as the part is being formed, you have your cross-links being formed as well. Again, we're cross-linking, so that enhances uh, resistance to stress cracking, uh, chemical resistance, impact strength, good weathering properties, overall toughness. Um, the melt strength itself can support up to temperatures about 210 Celsius. Uh, smaller molded articles that are not subjected to a load will not deform at temperatures where uncross-linked high-density polyethylene will melt and flow. That's the whole goal, is to get something that has a lot of the advantageous properties of polyethylene, mainly the cost, that doesn't flow above the melt temperature of polyethylene. The main uh, application, uh, main processing method where you use these cross-linked thermoplastics is rotational molding. The, the resins for rotational molding are more expensive than just pellet polyethylene because you have to powder the polyethylene in order to get into really small particles. Also, you have to add organic peroxide to it. And um, if you have a Gaylord of this stuff, uh, the organic peroxide, you know, say in your warehouse, the organic peroxide will eventually start to degrade. So that's why the resins are more expensive, even though they're polyethylene based. There's a lot of post-processing that goes into making those powders. The process of rotational molding, you've already done before. It's a split metal mold. The cold mold is filled with resin. Then it's closed back up and put in an oven and rotated simultaneously on two per perpendicular axes. And as it's doing that, a uniform layer of resin is deposited on the inside of the mold. And then after that time uh, has passed, the mold continues to rotate while it's being cooled. And then after it's sufficiently cooled, you can remove the part from the mold. This is not a positive pressure process. Uh, so the type of resin that you're using is kind of limited. Higher molecular weight resins really can't be rotationally molded. Uh, so blow molding grade or injection molding grade, they'll not flow uh, like they need to, to get a good homogeneous void free part. So um, it's, it, it is different than other traditional thermoplastic methods. This is the main way that fuel tanks are made. Uh, when you are testing fuel tanks, it's a lot of fun. Uh, this is a, its drop test. You take a 50 gallon tractor fuel tank, fill it with water and drop it 30 feet. Uh, it has a nominal wall thickness of 0.2 inches, weighed about 30 pounds. The part weighs about 450 pounds. And if it passes the test, after dropping it 30 feet, uh, you don't get any cracking. So that's why you cross-link these things. You get a polyethylene part that can withstand that sort of impact. Some uh, acrylates are cross-linked by either irradiation or chemical means. Typically, these are used in coatings, in the, also in the form of sheet, and in instrument, aircraft, and optical industries. The benefit to an acrylic sheet is that it's clear. Uh, and that is, is the main difference between something with polyethylene and something with acrylic. It has superior solvent and craze resistance, higher impact strength than the polyethylenes, and um, sometimes, but the, you also have to use special purpose cements if you're going to cross-link these materials. The coating systems that are acrylate, um, usually these are supplied as a combination of resin, cross-linking agent, and catalysts. These are no VOC systems. So the oligomer that's present contains unsaturation, and then uh, it's used with a monomer that also contains unsaturation, and you can apply high energy radiation, and then the monomer and all of those components copolymerize, 
um, and uh, through free radical mechanism. And this is done with a UV, this is all how the uh, UV powder coatings are done. So this is all in a solid powder and then it's exposed to UV and everything uh, cross-links into a, a continuous coating. So here are some uh, trade names and companies. So loose site or plexiglass sheet, uh, that's your acrylic sheet. Um, you can also get high molecular weight monomers from Chemlink. Marlex, of course, is Chevron Phillips, and that's where we get our cross-linkable high-density polyethylene from as well. Um, heat shrinkable tubing from Raychem. Also, you can get closed cell cross-linked polyethylene foam. Uh, so rotationally molded parts, uh, heat shrinkable tubing, and some acrylic sheets are really the main uh, application areas of cross-linked thermoplastics. So this concludes all of our lectures for thermoset resins. Once again, this is the only unique material that's on the final exam. Everything else is cumulative from the first uh, three exam modules. So uh, please prepare for your final exam.